Good morning. How is everybody? All right, good. I'm Andy Munn. I'm the pastor, and uh, um, want to welcome those on the live stream. Since that's still new for us, I probably need to wave and say hello. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, particularly Michael Trotter Lawson for working hard at getting all of the equipment and uh, things ready. You can't see it here in person, but on the live stream, instead of just having uh, this screen uh, in trying to keep it in focus, he's figured out a way to make it so that it's the clear projection like a computer screen. So uh, it actually looks better online now, probably even than it does here. So uh, um, at any rate, uh, thank you, Michael and Ben. Ben has been kind of his uh, gopher. Uh, <laughs> just two thumbs up there. Um, just want to remind you, we're having our Discovering Walnut Hill class today after the service. For those who, who want to find out more about the church, it's going to be a seminar format. We're taking a, about a six-week course and, and squeezing it into a very short period of time. But we also have lunch provided. So after the service, just make your way over to the fellowship hall back uh, the other building. Covering Walnut Hill, so we're going to do the second best thing. We're going to zoom in and uh, and have that over Zoom. So, um, but we want to pray for Lisa and her recovery. Um, Cheyenne Hauser got some really good news this week. Uh, she there there is no infection in her bones. They were very concerned about that. Now she so she broke her ankle, and uh, it was a very bad break. Um, they thought there was infection, and if that was the case, they were, if I'm understanding everything correctly, maybe y'all can help me, that they were going to have to fuse her ankle, but my understanding is they don't have to do that now. Is that right? Wow, that is amazing. Uh, so we want to thank the Lord for his kindness there of, uh, of healing her. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great reason to rejoice. Um, I would appreciate some prayer, just minor thing, but... I've got some kind of bronchitis thing going on, so um, good news for you is I won't be singing today, so, <laughs> but I will still be preaching, <laughs> so I'm on some, uh, some meds to keep me from coughing, <laughs> so um, what other prayer requests do y'all have? All right, well, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to worship you, to be reminded of your love for us in Jesus. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for those who are ailing. We have uh, several in our congregation who are experiencing some things. We pray for Lisa and ask for healing for her. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we also give thanks to you for, uh, for healing Cheyenne, and uh, uh, we just thank you for that good news for this young lady. And and uh, we pray that uh, this would be a wonderful reminder of your kindness to us 
Um, you've not promised that we're going to be healed of everything, but when, when you do heal us, it is a reason to rejoice. Father, I also lift up to you the things that are unnamed um, or, or prayer requests that we just have forgotten in this moment. Um, we know that you know, that you never forget, that you are at work. You are at work in every way, uh, in, in all of who we are, heart, soul, strength, and mind, our emotions, our relationships, our bodies. Um, you are ever working to your glory and for our good, and I pray that we might see that in the things that are going on in our lives and that we would see the blessing from your hand. We ask that you would be with us as we enter into worship that you would be exalted and glorified, and that you would meet us here and feed us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Mike? Shall we stand as we have our call to worship this morning? I like good introductions. <laughs> <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's join together as we sing praise to the Lord Almighty. cosmos, creator of this earth, the one who made us in your image. You made us to love you, to worship you, to obey you, to extend your kingdom, your rule and reign on your earth. And even with that special privilege and relationship, as we were uniquely made, we rebelled against you wanting to follow our own way. And instead of 
wiping us out and starting over with something new. You pursued us out of grace and mercy, satisfying your just demands by offering your Son in our place. We praise you, Father, for such a gift, for such love, for such mercy. And Jesus Christ, God the Son, we praise you for willingly sacrificing yourself for your enemies to make us sons and daughters of the King. And God the Holy Spirit, we praise you for opening our eyes as you minister God's word to us. Working by and with the word, you cause us to have faith in the only begotten Son, and you unite us to him and all of his benefits and all of his sufferings. By your work, we are made sons and daughters. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you and ask that you would meet us in this place even now and work in us what is pleasing to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We take this opportunity to have our confession of sin. Uh, I love these prayers and the way they're written out. And a lot of people say, well, what? what's the thing about reading a prayer? A prayer is a conversation with God. And, you know, how much do we enjoy being around someone who has great knowledge on something? We, we like to just listen and hear and learn and glean uh, from what they've learned. Well, a lot of these prayers are the same way. Um, th these are prayers that what they have learned in their life. I especially like today when... Uh, we get to the part where it says, uh, deep in our sorrow for the wrong that we have done. You know, we're all about that. But the next part says this, but for the good we have left undone. You know, that, that, that drives home a lot of thoughts to me. Uh, you know, how, you know we, we worry about the things that we, we do that are wrong, but how many times do we worry about the things that we didn't do uh, that were not pleasing God? So let's join together in our confession of sin this morning. O oh Father, we are gathered before you, the maker of heaven and earth, whose chosen dwelling place is with the broken and contrite, to confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart and soul. We have not loved you. their sins before the Lord. Our assurance of forgiveness is found in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stand as we prepare to sing worship.
Let's pray. Good morning, Father. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for providing for us. And thank you for making us your children. While we don't deserve your favor, you deserve our worship. You have earned it, and your existence deserves it, Lord. You compare yourself to all kinds of other things that are somewhat familiar to us humans. You call yourself a father, you call yourself a shepherd, you call yourself a husband and a friend and a king and all these things. But it's hard for us because you're not like human kings. You're not like human fathers or human husbands or friends or rulers. You're pure. You're good. Not mostly good or some of the time, but fully, perfectly, flawlessly, purely good. You won't abandon us. You won't abuse us. You won't manipulate us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And you have promised to never stop doing good to us. So in light of that, make us like you. Make, us lo make our love pure. Make it more holy. Make it more real. May we not limit ourselves to what we think Christian love should look like, but make it more unbounded and raw and real and free like Jesus is. Maybe not limit our understanding of you. May tradition and just habit not limit our understanding of what we think you can do or want to do with Walnut Hill or even what you can do or want to do with us in our lives. Yes, this in your name. If you would, join me for the Lord's Prayer up here or in your bulletin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let's start over. Wow. Now you can hear. Please turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We've been looking at the book of Ecclesiastes really since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, the reason for it, we'd started looking at the Gospel of John, and, and we just decided that because things were so strange, we were going to take a, a sidetrack and get back to the Gospel of John, which we will do uh, when we're finished with Ecclesiastes. And part of the reason, a large part of the reason we've been looking at Ecclesiastes is because it speaks about orienting our hearts. Uh, we have Solomon, the wisest man in the world, given wisdom from God, who uh, is writing to say, I've looked in so many different areas for meaning in life, and it's to be found in one place. So we've looked at all kinds of things about orienting our hearts over the past 14, 15 sermons in Ecclesiastes. And now we want to see how we orient our hearts when things seem hopeless. Now I know 
that, that you don't have any experience with feelings of hopelessness, right? <laughs> um, there's a group called the Wellbeing Trust. It's a consortium of sorts of medical professionals and others who have been paying attention to trends over the last several years, and they wrote a report at some point toward the beginning of the pandemic. It was entitled, Projected Deaths of Despair from COVID-19. It sounds very ominous, right? And they gave a warning about the, the pandemic. They, they wrote that more Americans could lose their lives to deaths of despair, which they would define as deaths due to drug, alcohol, and suicide, probably also other addictions, that more Americans could lose their lives to these types of deaths if we do not do something immediately. Deaths of despair have been on the rise in the last decade, and in the context of COVID-19, deaths of despair should be seen as the epidemic within the pandemic. And part of what they have been talking about, or what the, where they're getting their data is, from 1999 through 2018, the rate of suicides has gone up 35% in the United States. It was about 10 suicides per 100,000 people, and now up to, to 2018, 14, a little over 14 per 100,000. We understand despair. We understand hopelessness. Some of the practical ideas from the article are to get people working, get people connected, get mental health integrated, offer a vision for the future, get people care, and all of that we would say, of course, you know, those are good practical suggestions. But we have to ask, why are we in such despair? Especially for believers. When we read about pastors or Christian leaders committing suicide or, or being caught up in some kind of scandal, uh, being found out for some kind of addiction. We wonder, how could this happen? What's driving this? And we tend to see them as them and not us. But then when we dig a little deeper, we see that we also struggle with despair. We feel these feelings of hopelessness. And you might even be experiencing that right now. But we all have moments and times in our lives when we feel this. And, and we need to ask, is there hope for the hopeless? Is there hope in the middle of hopelessness? And how are we to orient our hearts when things seem hopeless? And that's what this passage of Scripture helps us to see. So I'm going to invite you to stand now. And we stand in honor of God who has given us His holy, inspired, and errant word. I'm going to begin reading just before our passage at Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16. Hear the word of the Lord. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one sleep, one's eyes see sleep. Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all. The same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. 
Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Father, we come before you now and we ask that you would take this, your holy word, and make it sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. You may be seated. So how are we to orient our hearts when things seem hopeless? There are, are three things that we see in this passage about hope, where we often look for hope, the ultimate enemy of hope, and the only sure place to find hope. Where we often look for hope, the ultimate enemy of hope, and the only sure place to find hope. So first, where we often look for hope. Verse 1 gives us a clue. It says, But in all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. Uh, the, the, the passage starts off with an assurance about God holding his people in his hand, and we're going to look at that in more detail a little bit later. But there's also a reality. It started in verses 16 and 17. We don't know the ways of God. We can work hard at trying to figure it out, but we don't know. When, it, when he says whether it's love or hate, what he's talking about here is we're not really sure if, if God is loving us or hating us here in this moment because we're considering both. And if you think about American Christianity, this speaks to us. Because in American Christianity, we think that God is blessing us when things are going well. We, we, we say, okay, you know, things are going well in my life. That must mean I'm a pretty good Christian. I must be doing things right. I must be living right. And then when things are going the way we don't want them to go, we begin to wonder, God, are you even there? Why are you cursing me here? Is it because I'm not living rightly? Now, there are times where we do certainly need to ask that question. But as one author pointed out in my study this week, Solomon warned in Ecclesiastes 6 that prosperity is not always a good thing. And in Ecclesiastes 7, that adversity and affliction are not always purely evil. So what is Solomon saying? He's saying, I, I've looked at these things. I've applied my heart to know wisdom. He says this twice in, in 8.16 and in 9.1. And, and, and I'm seeing that those who work hard to try to understand the work of God and those who are wise, they can't find it out. In fact, he uses the same word three times. They can't find it out. They can't find it out. They can't find it out. And when there's that kind of repetition, guess what he's meaning? We can't find it out. <laughs> In other words, God's ways are inscrutable. That's the $64 word today. Inscrutable simply means that God's ways are impossible to fully understand. Inscrutable, the same root word of scrutiny. You think about scrutiny, we're really trying to focus and understand and pick apart. Inscrutable means we can't. We can't fully understand God's ways, but we try. And what does this have to do with our quest to find hope? We often look to our own intellect and wisdom to find hope. And that's what Solomon is shattering here. This is what we do. This is what Solomon did. This is not uh, just in our generation, but it is in our generation. Since the Enlightenment, the 1700s, 1800s, the Enlightenment, remember that period where in Western culture, intellect and reason were valued more than anything else. 
Up until that time in Western culture, for the most part, there was a, a trust that God was the one who knew it all and that he told us what we need to know. Pretty good thing, actually, to me. But in the Enlightenment, we began to prize ourselves, our reason, our intellect, and that became superior. And Solomon is saying here to us, that's your problem. You often run to find hope in your reason, in your intellect. You're trying to find hope in knowing better than God why God does what he does. I mean, we can look at fairly recent history. Those who would say, ah, Hurricane Katrina, that was God's judgment on New Orleans. Could it have been? Maybe. Are we sure? No. This pandemic, there are theories about why it's happened, or is it really a pandemic at all, or whatever it is. We try to figure it out with our reason. We, we grab all these data sets and we say, aha, I know. And I know why God is or why God isn't. And then when it gets more personal, we run into especially the difficulties of life and we wonder, God, why? Are you no longer powerful? Do you not love me? And a big part of our problem is that we're trying to find hope in our own understanding. And throughout Ecclesiastes, we've been learning. We will not fully understand God's ways. But that doesn't mean that we give up trusting. Especially trusting in his providence. We'll never find true hope in our understanding of God's ways because we always have a limited understanding. The second thing that this passage tells us shows us where we often look for hope, but then it, it talk, talks about the ultimate enemy of our hope. In verses 2 and 3, we see these, these comparisons, these contrasts between basically the righteous and the unrighteous. This, this big list, all of these things. But we also see this. The same thing, the same event happened to all of them. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the evil, the clean and the unclean. It goes on and on and on. And at the end of verse 3 it says, after that they go to the dead. What is Solomon saying? He's saying the ultimate enemy of hope is death. Because death comes to all of us. It will not be cheated. In Psalm 23, it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. Death's shadow is what we all live under all the time. That's why we need the good shepherd. Death ends life as we know it, and it doesn't matter if someone is good or bad. Death will happen. And when we are faced with the ultimate reality of death, what do we do? Well, we could ignore it. We could pretend that it's not going to come to us. And quite frankly, for those of us who are a little older, we look, at back, at, we look back at our little younger selves, and we didn't really think much about death. In fact, we probably thought in some way, maybe we didn't cognitively say, I'm going to cheat death, but we just thought, that's a long way off. And so we make decisions and we do foolish things. And... But you can see in our American culture, and I'm picking on our culture because we are Americans, right? If we were in Africa, I'd talk about African culture and get to know it. But in our American culture, sometimes I think we think that wealth, success, and other things are going to insulate us from a reality of death. So we may kind of ignore the reality of death. Or we can go to the other extreme and we can fixate on death. We can worry about all kinds of things. We can, we can end up going to this despair, to kind of a nihilism of, of there's no meaning in life, there's no meaning in everything, we're all just going to die. If, if you've ever seen that wonderful theological classic, What About Bob? It's not a theological classic. There's the 13-year-old boy who has this death fixation, and his dad kind of pokes that apart. He's like... I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. That's kind of this nihilistic you know, view. Is it true? Yes. 
Can it rob us of hope? It can. It can lead us to despair. But if we kind of give up on those extremes and we just say, okay, there's a reality of death and um, and yet, you know, I, I want to keep it at bay. I'm going to try to find hope in something. And so what do we do? Not only do we try to find hope in our intellect, but then we run to other things. We run to distractions. We run to our work. We run to love, to sex, to success at whatever we think is important. We can run to food. We can run to all kinds of other things. The Bible calls these idols. These things that we erect to, to kind of distract ourselves from submitting and worshiping and loving the one true God. In, in fact, in Jeremiah 2, God, through Jeremiah, says these are broken cisterns that hold no water. And yet we try to drink deeply. Another theological classic, the three amigos. There, there's this scene where the three amigos are on their horses, they're, to the, they're going to the village of Santa Poco, and, and one has a, a canteen and lifts it up, and what comes out of the canteen, I think it's a Steve Martin character, I can't remember, maybe Martin Short, but lifts the canteen up and out comes dust, that's it. That's a great picture. It, I don't mean the movie's a great picture, I mean it's a great illustration for us <laughs> of what we try to do. These are the idols that are empty. They're not going to give us anything, and yet we run to them to try to find hope. And because they're empty, they won't find hope. And also, because we're finite, we'll never find hope in there. Our bodies will give up. Our minds will forget. Our appetites will change. And we will have to face loneliness and hopelessness. We need hope. We look for it every day, whether we realize it or not. And the ultimate enemy of hope is death. That's why when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Death is more than a physical reality. It is an all-life reality. That apart from God's saving work in Jesus Christ, we are separated from God now and for eternity. Well, this passage does not leave us with only seeing where we run. That's an empty pursuit. It doesn't only show us the reality that death is our end. It actually gives us hope and shows us the only place, the only sure place to find hope. That's our third point. The only sure place to find hope. Let's start at verse 1 and then we're going to move down. Verse 1 says, but I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise in their deeds are in the hand of God. Hope is found at the very beginning. The righteous and the wise in their deeds. It doesn't say absolutely everybody. It's talking about those who are God's. He holds us in his hand. The true hope that we are looking for, is found in the powerful God of the Bible. Not just any God, not just religion in general, but in the powerful God of the Bible, that he holds his people in his hand. How comforting. This speaks to God's providence over his people. We love thinking about this, and rightly so, of how God holds his people in his hand to the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, for eternity. But he's holding us in his hand now. The righteous and the wise and their deeds, what they're doing. He's holding us in his hand. It means that our lives now matter to him. In fact, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we love those verses. We should love those verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. And verse 10. For, 
We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We love verses 8 and 9, and we should. It's about salvation. It's not from us. It's from God. It's his grace come down to us. But he's also saved us for a purpose, to live out what he's called us to live out. He holds us in his hand. The righteous and wise in their deeds. Remember, the righteous and wise. We looked at this several weeks ago. There's this contrast and comparison throughout Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms, the wisdom literature, particularly the Old Testament. When Solomon is writing about the righteous and the wise, he's talking about those who trust in Yahweh, those who trust God. Solomon doesn't know how God's going to fully enact his plan of redeeming his people, but he trusts his promise. He doesn't know about Jesus Christ yet. This is hundreds of years earlier, but he knows that God has made a promise. And those who trust in Yahweh are trusting the God of the promise and that his promises will come true. And so true hope is found in the powerful God of the Bible. Ponder that for a moment. This is the God who created everything from nothing. We can't do that. Believe it or not, I like to cook. I don't do it that often. And I love to play around with spices and see what will happen. I haven't done that in a long time, by the way. I need to kind of get back to that. And, and, and so we might say, hey, look at my creation. It's funny. I didn't create the oregano. I didn't create the, uh, the red pepper. I didn't create the chicken that I'm cre- – I didn't create the fire. I didn't create the skillet or the grill or whatever it is. God created everything from nothing. He created humans to be a special creation, reflecting him, being his image bearers, extending his rule and reign on earth, loving them, and they love him back. They are to worship him and obey him. He made us just the way he wanted us to be. We had a perfect relationship with him because there was no sin in the picture. But for us, that wasn't good enough. We wanted more. And we disobeyed God and his command and brought sin into our own relationship with him, so death, and we brought death to ourselves and the world. God didn't stop even though he had every just cause to wipe us out in due time. He dealt with his just requirements by offering his son, Jesus Christ, in our place to pay the penalty for our disobedience, for our sin, so that by faith in him alone, we can have sure hope. This is the true hope that only the powerful God of the Bible offers. I don't know of any other religion that speaks of disobeying the gods and then not having to somehow pay back and earn your way back. You can't with God. The debt is too enormous. So instead, he paid the debt for us at the cost of his own son. This is why true hope is found in the powerful God of the Bible. This is how we can really appreciate that he holds us in his hand. Why does he do that? Because if we're not in his hand, we'll run our own way. There's something else the passage teaches us about this sure hope. The true hope from God brings life now and for eternity. Look at verse 4. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead man, than a dead lion, excuse me. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. It would be easy to read these verses on the surface and say, well, he's just talking about somebody who's alive and somebody who's dead. But that doesn't quite fit with the context. 
Because the living are those who are part of those who are held by God's hand. It's the righteous and the wise, and the dead are those who are living their own way. So in other words, the living are those who place their trust in God. The living are those who live by faith in God and his promises. That's not just a New Testament idea. That is an all of Scripture idea. The New Testament, though, tells us the rest of the story about Jesus Christ. About how God made good on his promise. And how by faith in him, we now have the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in our hearts. And that's the way that God holds us in his hand. We learn that Jesus Christ's sacrifice for sin is a complete sacrifice, the only effective way to deal with our sin, past, present, and future. Romans 8, 10, and 11 are a great summary. I was trying to find some verses that are a great summary. I always come back to these verses. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now remember, these two verses that talk about the spirit's work in us by faith in Christ come right after we learn there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This means that now we have hope. That we don't have to look over our shoulders every time we do something disobedient and and fear that God is going to cast us into hell. Jesus has secured our eternity and our present. It doesn't mean that we're flippant about sin. We're to deal with it. We're to live as children of Christ, children of God, purchased by Christ. But we're to understand the realities. That's why Paul said, my life is not my own. I've been bought with price. We have new life, empowered by the Spirit, that brings true hope now, and God securely holds us for all eternity. Because he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion of the day of Christ Jesus. There's a third aspect of hope that we see here. True hope from God allows us to find joy in life now. Verse 7, go and eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be white, let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shield to which you are going. What is he saying? He's saying there is joy in life now. That we can see God's hand in our lives now. That we can eat bread. That we can drink wine with a joyful, merry heart because God has already approved what you do. How is that? I'm, every, every author that I read this week said, This is a New Testament idea about our justification in Jesus Christ. That in Christ we have been made new. Yes, we still struggle now with sin and we have to deal with the sanctification being made holy and saying no to sin and yes to righteousness. But before God in our justification, he has already approved what you do. That brings joy. It takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it? It doesn't mean we just live however we want to live, but it does mean we can eat bread and drink wine with joy. We can love our spouses with deep love. Verse 10 was significant for me in a time that was really hopeless. I'd been unemployed for two years. I I thought that God was going to provide a ministry opportunity. It was really two and a half years. But I went into the the public sector, if you will, as opposed to church life, looking for a job with a bachelor's and a master's degree primarily focused in religion. You pretty much have to have a laser target towards something. 
that religion studies or something. I finally got on part-time at Pepsi, slinging Mountain Dew on grocery store shelves. And before you think it's really, oh, you drove one of the Pepsi trucks? No, it wasn't even that cool. I drove my 98 Honda Odyssey with a hundred and something thousand miles to each grocery store. I met the trucks there and would pull pallets onto the floor and sling Mountain Dew on the grocery store shelves. But just before that job, I had been studying Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. What is this passage saying? True hope is found in God leading us wherever he is leading us, and we will find joy in that. We need to see the joy in that. No job is too menial. I actually enjoyed my time at Pepsi. I, I was thankful for the work. There is joy in life now because of God's work. It's not just a distant memory. Yes, there's joy eternally, yes, but there's joy now. Sometimes it's just a matter of our perspective. Will we see that God is at work? Will we see that God really does love us? Even in the middle of the most difficult circumstances. In Paul's benediction in, in Romans 15, it's not quite the end of his letter, but there's this benediction after this, this one section that he's talking about a lot of different things. And it's always struck me. He says, may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. There is a connection between the hope God brings and joy and peace in our lives. Joy is a part of the Holy Spirit's fruit that he bears in us. Remember in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the singular fruit that has all these, these components of love, joy, peace, and all, the whole list. Joy is one of them. The Holy Spirit is working this, this deep joy in our hearts. It's not superficial happiness. That's American Christianity and, frankly, probably other places in the world. But again, I pick on us because we're Americans. We love to pretend we're happy when we're not. If you're happy and you know it, raise your hand. No, don't do that. We do. We, we try to make the happiness, the joy of Christianity on a superficial level as if we can't admit that there are really hard things going on right now. That's not the kind of joy that the Bible talks about. It's a joy that's down deep, that's inexplicable because of the, the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. Where we actually look at what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and we see that even though we have horrible circumstances in life right now, that is the one thing that matters more than anything else. And that's the foundation for our joy, our hope, our peace. It's all rooted in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus has destroyed the ultimate enemy of hope. He's destroyed death because he destroyed sin. For those who trust him. For those who receive him by faith. His death covers our sin and shame. His death gives us right standing with God the Father. We're no longer enemies, we're now children. Children of God Most High. The ones that He has made holy and acceptable in His sight. And we have a new standing. We've been washed clean. You see, true hope rests in faith in what God has done for us in Jesus. I'll close with this quote that reminds us there is hope and joy even now for the hopeless. It's from Jeff Myers in his book on Ecclesiastes. How can you enjoy life and be glad when you cannot tell God's attitude toward you? If the blessings you have do not mean that, God's lo that God loves you, if the curses you suffer might indicate that you are under God's curse, then how can you not worry about these things? The answer is not to look for signs of God's favor in, your, in our common life under the sun, but rather to listen to the word of God. Do you want to know what God thinks of you? 
Solomon tells you, God has already approved what you do. Believe the gospel. You are righteous in God's sight. Solomon is teaching us justification by faith. Indeed, he is teaching us justification by faith apart from works, for those are all vapor. It is only by faith that we can say that God has accepted us. There is hope in our hopelessness. Will you please be here? Father, I pray that you would take these words and drive them deep into our hearts. That you hold the righteous, the wise, and their deeds in your hand. That you have already approved us through your Son. Might we be reminded deeply of this reality for those who trust Jesus alone. In his name we pray. I invite you now to stand as we close in song. Joining us for the Discovering Walnut Hill Seminar, uh, just a reminder, we're meeting over in the Fellowship Hall for lunch. Uh, I think things are probably set up or will be very, very soon. Um, and uh, otherwise, we're just, we're glad that you're here today to join us, those who are live streaming and, and those who are in person. Now receive the Lord's benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in his hope. Go now in his hope his joy, and his peace.